Well, I cannot believe it. It is Resurrection Weekend, the end of Holy Week. I mean, if you think about how amazing it is for all of us right now, the church not being able to gather together because of all that's going on. But the beauty of the story, of course, is that the beginning of hope is always a problem, right? The beginning of a miracle always begins with some insurmountable issue. And if there was ever a time for a resurrection message, it's right now. I was talking to one of my older sisters here at Crossroads, and she was lamenting about what was going on. And she said, Pastor Daniel, you know, I always know when it's resurrection season or Christmas because you wear a button-down shirt. I, was, I always look forward to seeing my pastor with dreadlocks and a button-down shirt. So even though we can't be gathered together here on the Crossroads campus, I rolled out my Easter button down because it's just an amazing thing that we get to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus every single day. The reality that Jesus is alive is a ever present reality for all of us. And today, even though we're in unique circumstances right now, we want to be able to celebrate the resurrection. Now, I realize that people view the resurrection lots of different ways. And there are many people who are skeptical about the resurrection. There are many people who, like me, who embrace the resurrection. The thing that you have to realize is that the resurrection of Jesus from the dead is the thing that ultimately makes Jesus different from everybody else. Everybody wants to talk about how, oh, well, you know, Jesus is one of many great teachers. Maybe he's one of many prophets, one of many healers. But listen, only Jesus of Nazareth rose from the grave. And that is why Jesus ends up in a category all his own. And so today, we want to be able to explore the resurrection of Jesus. And so in order to get at that, we want to look at Luke chapter 24. We're going to be looking at verses 1 to 12, and then we're going to skip a section and look at verses 36 to 48 together. So open up your Bible, Luke's gospel, Luke's account of the resurrection of Jesus. So uh, if you want, open up another browser window if you want and type in the text there. You know, I wanted to look at Luke's gospel because Luke, according to biblical tradition, he was a doctor. And in writing his gospel, the gospel of Luke, and also in writing the account of the Acts of the Apostles, Luke is really giving a kind of a, a researcher's account of the life of Jesus. It, you find in Luke's gospel, we get all these discussions about uh, what it was like for Mary, the mother of Jesus' humanity. And, and really only Luke's gospel has that. In different situations, Luke would give diagnoses for people with different ailments where maybe the other gospel writers uh, wouldn't define it that way. And so I felt it was really important, especially in this season, to be able to look at what Luke's gospel says about it because Luke, in his own way, is very specific about the realities of the resurrection. And so picking up in Luke chapter 24, verse 1, I'm going to read the whole passage down to verse 12. It says, Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. And then they went in, and they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And as it happened... As they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by in shining garments. Then, as they were afraid and they bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but he is risen. Remember how I, he spoke to you when he was in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. Then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and other women with them who told these things to the apostles. And their words seemed to them like idle tales, and they did not believe them. But Peter arose, and he ran to the tomb, and stooping down, he saw the linen clothes lying by themselves, and he departed marveling to himself at what had happened. Now, really what you have going on here is the story picks up a few days after the death of Jesus where there's a number of women who are going to the tomb where Jesus was buried with spices that they had prepared. See, Jesus' death was so hasty on that 
Good Friday that literally they just put him in the tomb. They didn't even prepare his body for burial. So these women wanted to make sure that Jesus had a proper burial. But when they get there, they realize that Jesus isn't there and they meet these different angels. But I think what's fascinating is after this all happens, when you look at it in verse 9, you find that these women went to go talk to the apostles. And now listen to what it says in verse 9. Then they returned from the tomb, verse 9, and told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene and Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. And their words seemed to them like idle tales, and they did not believe them. Now listen, my friends, I realize that the resurrection may sound like nonsense. The resurrection may sound like nonsense to you because even as these women shared the fact that Jesus was resurrected to Jesus' own apostles, it sounded like nonsense to them. They heard these things and they were just like, they're like, Jesus is in there. And they're like, no, the disciples are like, this sounds like idle tales. This is, this is nonsense to Jesus' own followers. Now, to add to the whole story, of course, back at the time that this happened, women were not even allowed to testify in a court of law. And I just think it's absolutely beautiful that God had a bunch of women be the apostles to the apostles, and the apostles didn't even believe it. You know, and that's one of the reasons, oftentimes people say, well, you know, Christianity was made up. You know, those guys made up a religion. Listen, one of, the, one of the ways you realize that Christianity wasn't a religion that was just made up by people so that they could start a world religion is the fact that they had women testifying of Jesus' resurrection to the apostles. If the apostles got together and wanted to write a story so they could start a world religion, this is the last way you do it in that culture. To have women being the one ones telling them. And initially the apostles were just like, that sounds like idle tales. They don't even believe it, even though they're the followers of Jesus. And I realize that for many people today, the resurrection may sound like nonsense. Maybe you're in this place right now where you're hearing about this, that Jesus, he was crucified on the cross on Friday. And by the time they showed up on Sunday, he wasn't there and he's alive. And I mean, who can believe this? And I realize that Jesus dying and being resurrected might sound like nonsense to you. I realize that because it's only ever happened in the case of Jesus. Now, sure, there have been people who have been resuscitated. They, they, they lost uh, their heart stop for a season, and we were able to bring them back with different technologies that we have. But only Jesus, not only did he die, but he was dead for three days. Then he rose again, and Jesus did not die again. See, anybody who's ever been or, or, or resuscitated from dead, like Lazarus, right? Lazarus ended up dying again. Anybody who's ever gotten life back after some time of their heart stopping, they, they end up dying again, except Jesus, when he was resurrected, he's never died again. He ascended into heaven. And I realized that for some people, that sounds like nonsense. Maybe you're in that place today. You know, when the apostle Paul was testifying about this, listen to what it says in Acts chapter 26, verse 24. Now, as he thus made his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you are beside yourself. Much learning has drive it, driven you mad. When the apostle Paul shared of who Jesus was and his faith in Jesus, that the, the, the Roman governor was like, man, Paul, you're out of your mind. You, you've lost it. And I realize that for some people, that's exactly where we are right now. You're hearing this. You know it's Easter. You know it's resurrection time. And, and you're saying to yourself, Listen, man, this is, this is crazy. It's not even real. How can you even believe this? I thought you were a, a smart person, an educated person. How is it possible? But in the beginning, it sounds like nonsense, doesn't it? You can imagine the disciples, just a few days after the death of Jesus, having these women come to them and just being like, this is crazy. But here's the next thing I need you to realize. But the resurrection, it was fact-checked. We live in a fact check society, right? Anything that someone says, you fact check it. And we find out that the resurrection was indeed fact checked. Now, we had already seen the fact that you have these women who are going to the tomb. They find the stone rolled away. We know that from other gospel accounts that the Jewish leaders had the Romans uh, wanted a guard set and, and the Romans allowed the, the, the Jewish leaders to set a guard there. So there had been guards there. But they're perplexed, and they, and they notice the stone rolled away, and then all of a sudden, there's this testimony 
There's this declaration by these two angels where the angel says, why do you seek the living amongst the dead? He's not here. He's risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee. And they remind these women of Jesus's own words, how he said that he was going to be betrayed, given over to sinful people. He's going to be crucified. He was going to be risen from the grave. Again, another one of the truths of resurrection is Jesus had been telling his apostles this was going to happen over and over and over again in the Bible. They didn't understand it, but Jesus had been telling them. They just didn't get it. They didn't understand what was happening, right? And so these women are blown away because they're seeking the dead. They're seeking to find a dead body, but Jesus is alive. Why are you seeking the living amongst the dead, they say? And then they go and they tell the apostles. And now notice verse 12 of, of Luke 24. But Peter arose... And he ran to the tomb, and stooping down, he saw the linen clothes lying by themselves, and he departed, marveling to himself at what had happened. Now, I love this, because Peter hears the story. Peter himself goes to the tomb, and he sees it just as the women told him. So Peter is not just believing these, what seems like nonsense, right? He's fact-checking the thing, right? Peter wants to get some verification. Now, listen to what the apostle Paul said. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 6 to 8. After that, Jesus was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remained to the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles, and then last of all, he was seen by me also, as by one born out of due time. See, the apostle Paul is saying, listen, Jesus resurrected was seen by over 500 people and many of them were still alive at the time Paul was writing that letter to the church at Corinth. And he's like, and he was seen by James and all the apostles. And then he's like, and finally, he was seen by me. See, even though the resurrection may sound like nonsense to you, it's been fact-checked. And because of that, you have to realize that if Jesus had not been resurrected from the dead, there'd be no such thing as Christianity. Jesus would have been just another Jewish messianic figure who came and went from the scene. If you read the writings of Josephus, who was a, a Jewish man who wrote history for the Romans, Josephus tells of different stories of different people. You even get accounts in the Gospels where they make references to different messianic type figures, movements that went on. And the reality is, is had Jesus not been resurrected from that, all they had to do is show the body of Jesus in that day and this would have been over. But it was fact-checked over and over and over again. And if you're one of those people who are right now be like, listen, you know, I'm interested in Jesus, but who can really believe in the resurrection? I want to ask you, when was the last time you said, Jesus, if you're real and if you're alive, will you reveal yourself to me? Listen, I dare you to pray that prayer. If, if, if you're skeptical right now, I dare, I, I triple dog dare you to pray that prayer. Why? Because about 20 something years ago, I prayed that prayer. I had been hearing about Jesus and someone said, well, listen, are you really open? Are, are, are you just closed down or are, are you open if Jesus is, is alive? And I'm like, man, I'm totally open. If he's alive, I want to know. They said, well, listen, you should just sit down and pray and say, Jesus, if you're real, will you reveal yourself to me in a way that I can understand? Because I thought it was nonsense. I was skeptical of it. And sure enough, I prayed that prayer. And over the course of time, not immediately, I mean, it would have been crazy if it was immediate, but over time, Jesus revealed himself to me in very personal ways, which is why I stand here today as someone joyfully proclaiming the fact that Jesus is real, that he's alive, that he is resurrected from the dead, that the Easter season is not about candy and bunnies, although I think the bunnies are cute and I love the Easter candy. Easter is all about Jesus being alive from the dead, conquering sin and death. Now, I want us now to move down to Luke chapter 24 as we look at verses 36 to 47 together. So just a little bit farther down the chapter, I'm skipping over an amazing story that I would love for you to read in your own time, Jesus on the road to Emmaus, where Jesus reveals himself as resurrected to two of his disciples who were traveling. But it says this in Luke chapter 24, verse 36. It says, now, as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, peace to you. But they were 
terrified and frightened, and they supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. But while they still did not believe for joy and marveled, that he said to them, have you any food here? And so they gave him a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb, and he took it and he ate in their presence. Oh, I love this. You and I, in these uncertain times, you need to let Jesus give you peace. You need to let Jesus give you peace because as Jesus shows up, these two disciples who are on the road to Maus, they're telling the story and then Jesus shows up and knows what Jesus says. Jesus says, peace to you. Peace be with you. See, when Jesus arrives and even though everyone's, they don't understand, there's all these things that they don't get, Jesus just says a simple peace to you. And I believe that one of the great gifts of believing in Jesus is the peace that comes. Now, what's amazing is, is Jesus says, peace to you, and it says right after in verse 37, but they were terrified and they frightened and they supposed that they had seen a spirit. So Jesus comes with an offer of peace and Jesus' own offer of peace is met with fear and terror. But listen to what Jesus said in John chapter 14, verses 27 and 28. He says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give it to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You have heard me say to you, I'm going away and coming back to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice because I said, I am going to the Father. For the Father is greater than I. Do you hear what Jesus just said there? He said, don't be afraid. Let not your heart be troubled. I've given you peace. My peace I give you, I, I leave it with you. And I don't give it the way others give it, where they give it to take it back. And listen, right now in these uncertain times, the reason you and I have an unstoppable hope is because Jesus is alive. Jesus is resurrected from the dead. Jesus conquered sin and death. And Jesus wants to share a supernatural peace with you. That word peace in the Hebrew language is the word shalom. Jesus wants to leave his shalom the way everything ought to be. Everything working together. All the flourishing that comes with God's perfect plan. Jesus wants you to have that right here and right now because he's alive. You know what I love so much about when Jesus talks about this peace is the Bible teaches that when we put our faith and trust in Jesus, that we have peace with God. Now, I know people don't like hearing this, but until a person puts their faith and trust in Jesus, we're an enemy of God. We're an enemy of God because God is perfect and we are not. Because God is holy and all of us have failed. Because God is always loving and us not so much. And there is a severing in that relationship because anytime there is sin, there is brokenness in a relationship, right? But when a person puts their faith and trust in Jesus, then you have peace with God. And that's why if you're watching this right now and you're not yet a follower of Jesus, you need to be. You should be. There's no reason you shouldn't be because God sent Jesus to die on a cross so that as we believe in him, we can be at peace with God. That's the good news of the gospel. But then once we have peace with God, then Jesus shares with us the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding. It'll guard our hearts and mind in Christ Jesus. And listen, in these unique times, in times of fear and uncertainty. God wants us to have a peace that, is, that surpasses all human reality, all human understanding. That's the offer, and Jesus wants to give you that peace. Now, what I love about so much about what we read about the peace that Jesus gives is Jesus realized that they were frightened because they thought that they had seen a ghost or a spirit. They were, even though there was all this testimony, the, the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, they shared about meeting with Jesus. Peter saw the tomb empty. Uh, all the women who came saw, they saw the tomb empty. But then Jesus shows up and they're really scared. And Jesus seeks to assuage their doubts. He's saying, listen, Look at the wounds, the wounds in my hand and in my feet. 
He said, come here, hand, handle my body. No, no, no spirit, no ghost has a body like this. Now, if you're still think this is nonsense, you still have tons of doubts, when was the last time you brought your doubts to Jesus and said, Jesus, if you're real, here's the reason I'm doubting. Because not only do I want you to simply say, Jesus, if you're alive, reveal yourself to me in a way I can understand. Jesus is not scared of your questions. Jesus is not scared of our doubts. Actually, Jesus loves it when we bring our questions and our doubts to him. Because Jesus realizes that we're on a journey and he wants to help guide us through it. Now, I'll be honest with you. I have lots of questions. Sometimes Jesus doesn't answer them right away. Sometimes there's other things that Jesus is interested in. But I want to encourage you, don't be afraid to bring your questions and your skepticisms to Jesus. He can handle it. Because he's alive. He wants to meet with you right where you are. He's not ashamed that you have questions. I love it with the disciples. He's like, listen, here, handle me. And then what's so beautiful is Jesus is like, you guys got any food? It's one of the proofs that Jesus is Italian, <laughs> right? He's like, you got any food? They gave him some fish. And, and Jesus is just showing them, look, I'm alive. I have received my body back. And that's one of the beauties of the resurrection as well, is that Jesus got the same body back. That Jesus, for all of eternity, bears the scars of the love that he has for us. In Jesus' resurrection, he still has the, the nails in his hands and in his feet. See, that's what real love does. Real love is willing to bear the marks of the suffering that comes from being self-sacrificial. And for all of eternity, Jesus in his resurrected body bears the marks of the love that God has for us. A love that would send Jesus to die on a cross and to be resurrected from the grave for our failings. Now, look at Luke 24, verse 44. As we bring our time together towards a close, it says this, it says, then Jesus said to them, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which are written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Then he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem, and you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. My friends, this resurrection season, you should join Jesus in new life. You should join Jesus in new life because Jesus reminds them of all of the promises that the Bible had, what we call the Old Testament, about the work of the Messiah. I love what it says here, how, how he these are the words which I spoke to you and all the things that must be fulfilled in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And then verse 45 is amazing because it says, then he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Oh, I wish, I wish that we had that whole message. Verse 45. If, if somebody would have just been able to take dictation on the way Jesus opened up the scriptures to them, opened up the law of Moses, opened up the prophets, opened up the Psalms and said, look, this is all the story of what I was going to do. And then he reminded them it was necessary that Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah was to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day. It's God's will that the name of Jesus is preached, that Jesus is inviting all of us to repentance, which is a, a change of mind, which leads to a, a change of direction, which leads to a change of heart, which leads to a change of destiny, right? Where we turn from running from God and we turn to God. And that the remission of sins, that Jesus forgives sins, should be preached in the name of Jesus to all nations, starting right where they were in Jerusalem. Oh, how powerful is that? But Jesus says, listen, before you preach, I want to empower you with my Holy Spirit. See, he's saying, listen, there is new life available for each one of us, for each one of you. It's something that I received 
20 years ago, and every single day I'm, I'm experiencing more and more of who God is. But listen, this Easter weekend, listen to what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. It says, For he made him, speaking of Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. See, that's what the cross is all about. The cross is all about God the Father placing all the sins on the world on the Son, Jesus. God made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. That we might become God's righteousness in Jesus. And so on the cross, Jesus took our sin. And then when we believe in him, God shares Jesus' righteousness with us. I like to call that the great switcheroo. Only God could pull something like that off where all of my failings God placed on Jesus at the cross and all of Jesus' perfections God places on me when I believe upon him. This is the new life that's available. When God sees one of his kids in Christ, he sees them perfected in Christ because they see Christ in him. And that's why it also says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are becoming new. My friends, this is what resurrection is all about. If anyone's in Christ, God makes them brand new. The old things, they're gone. God is making everything new. And that's the invitation right here, right now, at all times to each one of us. And if you've been watching this and you're already a follower of Jesus, listen, receive Jesus' peace. Never doubt the resurrection because it was fact-checked. And even when you have doubts, you bring them to the Lord. But right now, you get to walk in newness of life. And if you're already a follower of Jesus, listen, don't live in the old ways any longer. Don't allow yourself to live the old ways when God wants to do a fresh work. God is inviting you to, 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 to turn away from the old life and lean into the brand new life that he bought for you with his own blood at Calvary's cross. But I also realize that there are many of you right now who've never put your faith and trust in Jesus. And, and maybe for you, it, it just seemed like nonsense. Like, how can I believe in the resurrection? I mean, come on, right? But now you're realizing it's been fact-checked. There, there was all these people who met with Jesus, and Jesus is offering peace. And maybe when he offers you peace, it just freaks you out more. But listen, he wants to give you peace, and he gives you peace by giving you brand new life. And all Jesus is asking of you right now is that you would reach out your hands of faith and receive God's free gift of salvation. I actually believe that your ability to reach out your hands in faith is also a gift. But it is a choice that you make. God, by His Spirit, is encouraging you to receive the gift of salvation. I believe for many of you, there's been many people along the way who've been encouraging you. Say, listen, put your faith and trust in Jesus. You know, oftentimes people say, well, I'll believe in Jesus if I see Him. I always tell people, if you believe in Him, you will see. We, get, we want it the other way. We're like, well, if he shows himself to me, then I'll believe in him. Listen, if you believe in him, you will see him everywhere. And it is an opportunity for you right here, right now, to be born again, to join in Jesus's brand new life. And there is no better way to celebrate Easter and the resurrection season than by walking in the reality of the resurrection as Jesus shares his brand new life with you. And I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that in just a moment.